Okay, so in this segment, we're going to be talking about the ERF functional outcome measures and the ERF um, process measure. And so let's just get to the first slide. So as always, there's a lot of abbreviations. I'm sure many of these are very familiar to you. So in particular, I will highlight impact, uh, as in the Impact Act, because that is one thing that we're going to be talking about as part of these measures. And the objectives of this session is to identify key components of a quality measure, describe the inpatient rehab facility quality measures related to function, and identify resources that detail measure calculation specifications. So there, there are a lot of steps involved in calculating these quality measures, so I will step through some of the main pieces. I'll give you a little bit of background about how the measures were developed. I believe based on questions that have been submitted that there's some interest in that, so I will slip in a little bit of that information, uh, hopefully to help you understand that. And um, I guess to get started, let's talk about key components of a quality measure. So um, quality measures, as defined by CMS, uh, there's a lot of specifications that we need to put, that CMS will put together, and that's to ensure that you know how to actually, how, how a quality measure is calculated. So when a quality measure is put out uh, on Earth Compare, you want to know how that was calculated, I'm sure. And so that's part of the information that CMS provides. And so you will often see when uh, measures are proposed through rulemaking or they're discussed during uh, measures application partnership that you will hear people talk about target populations, numerators and denominators, exclusion criteria, data elements, risk adjustment approach, and calculate calculation algorithms. So one of the things I wanted to stress here is that it's not just data elements that are an outcome measure, but an outcome measure from a quality measure perspective refers to basically the collection of data, the analysis of that data at the facility level, and part of that is making um, decisions along the way about how that data, when it's aggregated at a facility level, can measure quality of care. And so there have been, for these functional uh, measures that I'll be talking about, many expert panels over the years talking about things like exclusion criteria as well as risk adjustment and calcula calculation algorithms. So there are actually five uh, functional quality measures. Uh, the first one is called application of the percent of long-term care hospital patients with an admission and discharge functional assessment and a care plan that addresses function. So this is actually a cross-setting uh, quality measure and it was actually a measure that was initially endorsed for the long-term care hospital uh, setting and when the Impact Act passed, it was modified basically. So when we say an application of, that just means it's a modification of the original measure. It is NQF endorsed, as I said, for the LTAC setting. We have, because the names are long, uh, and those are the official names, you'll see on the uh, right side of the table that we have a shorter, briefer name so that uh, we can quickly refer to these measures if we talk today. So the um, first one basically is application functional assessment, or sometimes I'll call it the process measure. The four other measures are uh, all earth functional outcome measures, meaning that outcome refers to end results of care. So the first one that's listed that's an outcome measure is change in self-care score for medical rehabilitation patients. Again, this is an NQF endorsed measure. We uh, shorthand call this change in self-care. The next measure refers uh, to mobility, and that is called the ERF functional outcome measure, change in mobility score for medical rehabilitation patients, and we short, short name change in mobility. The next two um, quality measures are, again, functional outcome measures, but in this instance, we're looking at discharge self-care scores, and this uh, first one is called the discharge self-care measure, and then we also look at discharge uh, mobility score, and that's called the discharge mobility measure. Uh, 
So I'm going to start off talking about the process measure. So as I mentioned, it's called application of because it was originally endorsed for long-term care hospitals. And this particular process measure is, of course, calculated using IRFPI data. We just went over um, the items included in this measure. It was implemented across all post-acute care settings to meet the requirement of the IMPACT Act. So it was introduced actually to the IRF setting. Um, October 1, 2016 for the initial data collection. Um, it basically is a simple process measure with the idea that doing functional assessment is very uh, important in order to uh, consider uh, an appropriate care plan and setting goals for, for patients who are admitted to an ERF. So basically this measure, uh, as noted in the third bullet, reports the percentage of ERF patient stay level records with an admission and discharge functional assessment and a care plan that addresses function. So we use uh, patient stay level records. That's because if a patient is admitted multiple times, perhaps during the uh, 12 months where the data are aggregated by CMS, it, that person would be included both times. So that's why we don't say patient level, but it's patient stay level. So if somebody's admitted three times during a 12-month period that's under consideration, they'd be in there three times. The treatment goal provides evidence that a care plan with a goal has been established. So basically, um, Manisha covered the, uh, co the coding of goals. I talked a little bit about it at the end of my presentation, prior presentation. So if there's at least one goal that's reported, that provides evidence that function is included in the care plan. Documentation of goal, um, as I said, it, uh, sorry, sorry, I just said that first bullet already. Uh, the function goal is report, recorded at admission for at least one of the standardized self-care or mobility functional items using six-level rating scale or one of the activity not attempted codes. So again, just one self-care or mobility activity will, is acceptable for this particular quality measure. So um, as I said, a quality measure has typically a numerator and denominator. And so we have a graphic here basically saying that the numerator is the number of patients with functional assessment data for each self-care and mobility activity and at least one self-care or mobility goal. The denominator is all of the IRFPI assessment um, records that are submitted every day. And uh, that is the uh, Medicare Part A as well as Medicare Part C. So that's all the Earth Pi assessments that you're submitting. I do want to highlight that there, um, there is a difference in terms of uh, the end of a stay for patients who have complete and incomplete stays. So I will first talk about uh, the stays that are complete stays. So somebody is admitted and the program is provided and the person is hopefully discharged home or discharged onto a next setting, and so the treatment plan has been implemented. So in this case, there's three criteria that are necessary to get into the numerator. The first, which is in the first box, number one, you need a valid numeric score indicating the, pa the patient's functional status for section GG or a valid code indicating the activity was not attempted uh, for each of the functional assessment items on admission. So if the person is too ill or the person's refusing, the, the assessment was done, so that's, and any of those codes are acceptable. Number two, a valid numeric score, which is a discharge goal indicating the patient's expected level of independence or a valid code indicating the activity uh, was not attempted for at least one self-care or mobility item on the admission assessment. So basically one goal, and it can be one through six or any of the activity not attempted codes. And then third, a valid score um, indicating patient's functional status or one of the valid codes indicating the activity was not attempted on the discharge assessment. So basically, admission assessment for the um, items that I will cover in just a sec um, in section GG, one, at least one goal, and then discharge assessment completed. In the event that a patient has an unexpected discharge or um, uh, there's a circumstance that happens that it's difficult to do a functional assessment at discharge, uh, 
uh, that's considered an incomplete stay. And in that instance, if there's, for example, a medical emergency, you need to take care of that medical emergency. You should not be doing a functional assessment asking the person to eat or to transfer, right? So you are only required to do an admission assessment for this quality measure and put in a goal. Um, we, I, did, I think there was one question that somebody submitted. Uh, what if somebody... Um, is transferred out or passes away very quickly after admission and an initial evaluation hasn't been completed, do we still have to put in a goal? And the answer is yes, do put in a goal. And it can be based on what you thought was going to be the person's goal based on your pre-eval. But do enter a goal uh, for every, every patient's day for this quality measure. Um, oh, there was one question, sorry. Um, somebody did ask, why are functional assessment data not required at discharge for incomplete stays? And it's because, again, uh, you know, you should be focusing on whatever is happening, the medical emergency. Um, and when we were actually, so uh, this issue about incomplete actually started when uh, we were doing the research related to the post-acute care payment reform demonstration. And so we met with a lot of clinicians and said, how do you code discharge function when somebody has, you know, this event where they need to leave urgently? How do you code that? Some people told, told us that they coded what the per last evaluation had been. Some people coded you know, low level about what was going on when the person left. And so we didn't really feel that there was like a standard way that people were doing it and the data were comparable. And so when we brought up the option to clinicians, what if, you know, we just, you know, said that you didn't have to do it at discharge because it was a, you know, medical unplanned event. And uh, that was considered to be an important um, piece of, of this quality measure. So, um, so, uh, as I said, for somebody who has an incomplete stay, um, and that is defined in the manuals. Uh, for example, anybody discharged to acute care, we consider unplanned. Uh, it is possible, of course, that somebody is discharged to acute and it's, you know, like a planned surgery flap. Uh, we're not able to differentiate that when we do the analysis of the IRFPI. All we know is somebody's discharged to acute care. On the IRFPI, there's no unplanned discharge code or anything, unlike the other data sets and the other settings. So basically, anybody discharged to acute, um, that's considered an incomplete stay. So at this point with the IRFPI, there's actually a skip pattern, so you never actually get to code those items in the event that there's an incomplete stay, so no discharge assessment. So I hope that answered the question that somebody submitted. Okay, so the items that are included in this particular quality measure are uh, eating, oral hygiene, toileting hygiene. Obviously, you know, we covered a lot more items and the other items are included in the other quality measures, but for this particular quality measure, again, this is cross-setting, so this is the measure that's used in home health, in IRFs, SNF, LTACs, and um, skilled nursing facilities. So just looking at these three items that were considered important for all of those settings to get started. The mobility activities that are included include sit to lying, lying to sitting on side of bed, sit to stand, chair, bed, chair, chair to bed transfer, toilet transfer, uh, also the walking items and the wheelchair items. If you trigger a skip pattern because an activity didn't occur, you have still completed the activity because basically, um, if you're interested, um, when the data actually comes to us as we analyze the data, we get a little carrot in the data, which means that it was skipped. And so we know that you actually coded, let's say, the 10 feet as activity not attempted. And so we know actually you, you did the assessment because it, it wasn't applicable for the person. So this quality measure is a process measure and it is not risk adjusted. Basically, the completion of the functional assessment wouldn't vary based on somebody's complexity. So patients who are more complex, you're probably gonna have more activity not attempted codes, but those codes count. And so basically there's no risk adjustment required because you can complete a functional assessment for every patient. 
If you're interested in more information about this, um, there is actually a uh, web page that we have dedicated, CMS has dedicated to the function measures, and so there's uh, specifications there in case you're interested. As I mentioned before, this is an NQF endorsed measure. If you actually look for this measure on the NQF website, you're actually going to get the LTAC measure, which is not, this is a modification of that. So if you're interested in the ERF version of this, you actually need to go to this website. Okay, so now I want to get into the outcome measures, which are much more interesting. Um, so the first one that I wanted to cover is 2633, which is change in self-care. And for this uh, measure, obviously, the data come from the ERFPI. Um, the measure, just as a general description, it estimates the risk-adjusted change in self-care scores between admission and discharge, and it includes ERF patients who are 21 years and older. The change in self-care is calculated as the distance difference between the discharge self-care score and the admission self-care score. So if somebody's discharged at um, 30, uh, the person was admitted at 20, the difference is 10 units. Target population is patients who are at least 21 years of age, Medicare beneficiaries because that's the EARFPI population, uh, and individuals who are not independent in all self-care activities at the time of admission and who have complete stays. So I'll go over a little bit more of these details under exclusion criteria, but I did want to basically talk about data collection related to this particular measure. So obviously, not a surprise, the admission and discharge function data, section GG, um, self-care activities are required to calculate this measure. There are also risk adjusters that are used to calculate this quality measure, and that, of course, is because not every patient admitted to an ERF is going to gain an equal amount of self-care uh, ability because of their medical conditions, comorbidities, perhaps their age. Many factors can affect how much functional improvement individuals um, are able to, to uh, um, gain during a rehab stay. And so there are several risk adjusters at the time of admission um, that are uh, reported and are used as part of the risk adjustment approach. Um, I do want to mention that there have been many expert panels to come up with a lot of the specifications, so I'm going to next talk about exclusion criteria. So uh, we initially had um, an expert panel in, I think it was about 2012. There was a large cross-setting expert panel in 2013, and that's where a lot of some of these initial decisions about exclusion criteria were discussed. I think there's some people in the audience. Uh, Chris, I think you were on some of those early TEPs. Um, so anyway, just so you're aware, there's been a lot of discussions about these things over time. If you do have feedback, certainly we welcome your feedback also. Um, so basically, the first exclusion criteria is patients with incomplete stays. So I talked a little bit about that before, but as you can kind of probably surmise, uh, if different uh, clinicians had different approaches to collecting discharge data uh, in the event that somebody had an unplanned uh, or an, a discharge to acute or had some kind of incomplete stay. It was kind of hard to compare the data when people had different approaches to collect the data. And so the consensus was that other quality measures would pick up things like readmissions, basically. And so for this particular quality measure, uh, patients with incomplete stays are excluded because we don't have the discharge data. Patients who are independent in all self-care activities at the time of admission. Uh, basically, if mathematically you're at the top of the scale, you cannot improve in function. You can only actually decrease theoretically. And so um, those uh, patients are excluded just because they can't show improvement with the items in the data set. That happens, uh, it happens very rarely, but it actually we have seen a little bit of that in the data, but it's, um, yeah, it's, it shouldn't be happening very commonly. Um, we also, when we had our discussion with the expert panels, uh, we asked if there were certain patients who maybe had um, functional improvement that was maybe hard to really predict or maybe was very limited. And so we have various uh, medical conditions that are exclusion criteria. So for example, patients who are admitted in a coma, pretty rare, 
but we do see a little bit of it in the data. So if, if recovery from coma might be very difficult to predict, and so those individuals are not included, as well as individuals with persistent vegetative state on admission. Uh, complete tetraplegia, locked in state, uh, severe anoxic brain damage, cerebral edema, and compression of the brain. Um, as I said previously, uh, individuals younger than 21 are excluded. Uh, we had, when we were doing some of the initial work, we had very few people under 21 and didn't feel like we could make a uh, valid estimate of their expected functional improvement. Uh, we continue to look at that. Um, Patients who were discharged to hospice, so the idea behind this exclusion criteria is that somebody may have been admitted and maybe had a new diagnosis or something worsened with their condition, and so if somebody discharged to hospice, it may be their goals changed during the rehab stay, and so those individuals are excluded. Again, you know, we, the analysis that's done uh, for this measure is basically looking at IRFPI, so there is, on the discharge destination, there is a hospice to home or institutional facility, both are included uh, for that criteria. And lastly, uh, patients who are not Medicare beneficiaries because the data is not available to CMS. So the change in self-care activities includes all of the self-care activities that Manisha covered today. So eating, oral hygiene, toileting hygiene, shower, bath, self, upper body, lower body, and taking on removing footwear. For those of you who are interested, I think there's been some questions about range of function. So. Um, as you know, you know, there is a six-level rating scale with uh, seven activities. So on admission, the range for um, the admission score is 7 to 42, discharge 7 to 42. So somebody who comes in at the lowest level would be a 7. Person who leaves, let's say, at the highest level can gain 35 units. When we look at the national data so far, what we've seen is the average is 11 point Let's see, 11.5 across all Earth's average change in self-care. So I do want to talk about risk adjustment next. Um, and just, again, a little bit of background. So patients treated in Earth vary in terms of primary diagnosis, demographic characteristics, as well as other things like coexisting conditions. And patients may have different expected functional improvement based on these factors. Therefore, this quality measure is risk adjusted. And the purpose of risk adjustment is to control for specific patient characteristics that may affect patients' outcomes, and we need to do that in order for data to be compared across ERFs. So we're kind of leveling the playing field, I guess, is what many people will say. Um, there are many risk adjusters that we use. Um, this is just kind of a master list. If you're really interested in this, um, there's some resources that I'll talk about at the end. But basically, um, the initial work that it was involved in coming up with this list of risk adjusters for this measure as well as the other measures, uh, we did a review of the literature. We identified what factors based on the literature were associated with functional outcomes. A lot of that literature was condition specific, but we compiled everything we could. We reviewed it with an expert panel, got additional feedback from experts, and then we ran data analyses. So the original set of analyses were run with the post-acute care payment reform demonstration, but obviously since then we have the national ERF data, and so we have been able to use the national data to look at risk adjustment and the importance of each of these um, covariates or risk adjusters. So um, just as an example, so we, we have age group here. So the data that we have, the age is not normally distributed, and so we basically created age groups. And so as a patient, uh, if you're thinking about risk adjustment for a patient, you would need to know the age of the patient in order to know how the risk adjustment would apply to that person. We also adjust for admission function, and because the, there's not a linear relationship between admission function and change in function, this particular measure, we do actually use a squared version of the self-care score in addition to the continuous version of the score. We look at primary diagnosis, so uh, patients who are recovering, for example, from a stroke versus 
fracture have very different outcomes. And so our regression model basically takes that into account. We also found that admission function and the primary diagnosis interacted. And so we do include that in the model. Uh, Manisha covered uh, prior functioning, so we adjust for prior functioning, whether somebody had major surgery in the recent uh, near prior to admission. Um, uh, the presence of pressure ulcers on admission makes a difference, and in fact, a stage two versus a stage three for unstageable makes a difference, so we adjust for both of that. So if somebody had both stage two and stage three, there would be adjustment for both of those. If the person only had a stage two, then that would just be adjusted for. Cognitive function using the BIMS, communication impairment using the B items, bladder and bowel incontinence, swallowing problems, and there's a list of comorbidities that I won't uh, go through with you, but they're basically in the risk adjustment overall. We analyze the national data, so we have plenty of data to work with, and overall for the self-care uh, model, I think we have about 70, 75 risk adjusters when, it, when you count each age group, each diagnosis group, and each comorbidity. So there's a lot of things that we take into consideration. If you're interested in the details, uh, there is a table at the, um, in a document that basically lists out, so actually here you can see the age categories that we use, less than 35, 35 to 44 years, 45 to 54, 55 to 64. We use the 65 to 74 group as our reference category, and uh, there's two other uh, or actually three other age groups, one of them isn't on this. This is all available in the quality measure, um, uh, earth quality reporting, measure calculations, and reporter using, user's manual. And I do have the link to this at the end of the presentation. So I just want to cover uh, how the observed self-care score is calculated. I'll talk a little bit about risk adjustment, but there's not really enough time to go into depth, but certainly happy to take questions about that too. Um, at the end of the day. So basically, to get the observed change in self-care score, you would calculate the admission mobility score after recoding. Any activity not attempted codes are recoded to one dependent. So you will get the range that I mentioned before, 7 to 42 for the admission self-care score. You would then calculate a discharge score after recoding. Any skips, uh, missing or activity not attempted codes are recoded to one, so the discharge can be anywhere from a 7 to 42. We, uh, the analysis would then identify any excluded uh, stays, so under somebody under 21, somebody had an incomplete stay, somebody who d was discharged to hospice, so then you're left with the included stays for your facility. You would then calculate the change score, which is basically the um, difference between the discharge and admission, and that would be calculated for each individual in the IRF and then averaged across the IRF. Um, we, we want to be sure that everybody can replicate uh, the ca measure calculation, so we actually tell you even in the manual that I mentioned how many decimal points. Um, so actually the risk adjusters all go to four decimal places, but when it's reported in the reports, we just use one decimal place. But that's just an idea for those of you who are data geeks, it's there for you. Um, <laughs> I do want to talk a little bit, I guess, about risk adjustment. I don't have a slide on it, but um, just as an example, um, so if you have the change in self-care score uh, that's observed, there's a parallel process where there's a risk adjusted uh, or an expected value that's calculated, and that's where the risk adjustment comes in. So basically, on uh, the website that I will show you, there are regression coefficients. So as I said, that we use national data to calculate a regression model. And there are intercepts uh, for each model, one intercept for each model, which is kind of the starting point. So for self-care, the current uh, risk adjustment uh, model has uh, the intercept is 23.5009, and then each person's characteristics, so if we have somebody whose age is in the 75 to 85 range, you would apply the regression coefficient for that uh, covariate, that age group, which 
you know, the current model has minus 0.5919. So basically it becomes an algebra uh, equation there. You basically take the intercept and you start applying all the regression coefficients. If somebody has a pressure ulcer stage two, that has a weight of minus 0.9697. So all those get added or subtracted together, and then you actually have an expected score. So based on the national data, the person with the characteristics that I was just making up there would have an observed score that we calculated and an expected score that's calculated. And the actual calculation is basically at this point you put the, uh, you make a ratio of the observed over expected. So let's say somebody was a observed to gain 11 units, they were expected to gain 11 units, the ratio would be one. And then you actually multiply that by the national average. So I told you the national average was 11.5. And so the risk adjusted um, score uh, in this instance would be 11.5. So there's a lot more details obviously in the manual about this, but I just wanted to give you a flavor of uh, how it all works. And this you know, can be calculated fairly easily if you, if you know the steps. Um, if you are interested in more information, uh, this is, as I said, um, an NQF endorsed measure. This is specific to the earth setting. So if you go to the National Quality Forum website, you will actually see these specifications. I will note that uh, the measures are actually undergoing uh, maintenance endorsement. So we, uh, CMS has actually updated some of the specifications a little bit, and that's under review. If you go to the NQF website, you'll see updated specs available. You're more than welcome to look at um, what's under review right now. Uh, and if you're interested, I know there were several questions about reliability and validity. There is a ton of reliability and validity analyses in there. If you're interested in that, uh, Roche analysis, uh, uh, Chromebach Alpha, a, a lot of different analyses looking at the relationship between discharge scores for each item and discharge destination, percent going home. So there's a lot of information there if you're interested in looking at that. Okay, so moving on to the next uh, quality measure. So as you can imagine, this is very similar. Uh, this, in, uh, this particular measure focuses on mobility. And so uh, obviously we're using the mobility items. It is, of course, data from the IRFPI. This measure estimates a risk-adjusted mean change in mobility score between admission and discharge among IRF patients ages 21 and older. The change in mobility score, similar to the self-care measure, basically is the difference between discharge and admission. And um, the national average, by the way, for um, this particular uh, quality measure, the national mean is 28.5. So on average, uh, patients in IRFs are gaining about 28.5 mobility units. The target population, similar to the prior measure, it's uh, patients who are 21 years of age and older, Medicare beneficiaries who are not independent in all uh, mobility items at the time of admission and with complete stays. Same as the uh, prior measure, there is of course the GG mobility data that are required to calculate the measure as well as risk adjusters. Um, there are some differences in the risk adjusters across the two self-care, between the self-care and mobility measure. Um, so we basically started off with the idea that the risk adjustment models, the covariates or risk adjusters would be similar, but in the analyses we found things, for example, in the mobility measure, things like a history of fall was actually an important risk adjuster. It was not significant in the self-care model, and so it is included in the mobility model. I think overall in the current mobility risk adjustment model, there's like 85 covariates. A lot of them do overlap, so the pressure ulcer stage two versus the pressure pressure ulcer stage three, four, unstageable, those are the same across the two. There's different weights, but the models basically are specific for the measure. So as with the uh, change in self-care, uh, the same parallel, I guess I'll call them, uh, exclusion criteria apply. So uh, patients uh, with incomplete stays are excluded, patients who are independent with all mobility items at the time of admission. And 
so I'm, this would be unusual, right, for an Earth patient to be independent in all mobility activities on admission, so that probably should be something you look at your data and make sure that's not what's submitted. Um, similar to the change in self-care, um, there are patients with certain medical conditions who are not expected or may have unpredictable improvement, and so those uh, individuals are currently excluded. That includes patients in a coma, persistent vegetative state, complete tetraplegia, locked-in state, severe anoxic brain damage, cerebral edema, or compression of the brain. Patients younger than 21 are excluded, patients discharged to hospice, and patients who are not Medicare beneficiaries. And again, the risk adjustment and the exclusion criteria are applied so that the data are comparable across ERFs. So it may be that your institution takes many patients with these types of conditions, and so your patients may not be expected to gain as much or the gain would be unpredictable. And so from the quality measure perspective, that's taken into account so that it, it is uh, the types of patients that you treat is not unfairly uh, um, affecting your, your quality measure score. So the mobility um, activities included in the change in mobility uh, quality measure are the ones that we've talked about, so uh, bed, some bed mobility activities, some transfers, including car transfers, some walking items, steps, and pick up object. The um, risk adjusters, as I said, very similar to what you saw before. The same age groups are used. Um, again, the um, uh, Admission uh, score is used, it says self-care on the score, sorry, it's actually the admission mobility score as well as the admission mobility score squared, sorry for that typo. Uh, primary diagnosis, again, is incorporated in the interaction between the admission mobility score and the primary diagnosis. The uh, fact that somebody had surgery before or not, patients who had surgery before tend to actually have slightly better recovery of function, and so that's a risk adjuster, prior functioning. You'll actually see stair negotiation for prior functioning is in the mobility measure. I don't think it was included in the self-care model. Uh, pressure ulcer, we talked about bladder, bowel, Basically, these all speak to the severity of the condition. So, you know, somebody, for example, who's had a stroke and has a lot of these things going on, obviously it's um, more challenging to help them in terms of improve in function. So that all is accounted for here. So similar to what um, I mentioned the, um, with the self-care measure, for this particular one, um, uh, for this particular uh, quality measure, this uh, information is actually in the second column. In order to be efficient, basically, uh, at the back of this manual that I mentioned, there's one table, and each of the quality measures, you'll see a check if that risk adjuster is included in that quality measure. So as you can tell, the first row, the, there's an intercept for each model that's used, and for each of the uh, quality measures, the four quality measures that are outcome measures, the age groups are all the same, and for all of them, the age 65 to 74 is a reference category for all of the models. So similar to what um, happened with the change in mobility measure that um, I described, it's the same process, so I'll just walk through it just to be sure it's clear. So basically, you would start off to calculate the observed change in mobility score um, by uh, adding up the scores for the 15 mobility items. Uh, that would be after there's recoding, so any skips or um, activity not attempted codes would be recoded to a one. Uh, the same thing would be done for the discharge mobility score. You would get, again, a score. Uh, because there's 15 mobility items, the uh, lowest score, if somebody got a 1 after recoding on all the activities, the lowest score that you would get is 15. And the highest score that you could get with 15 times 6 is 90. So the range is 15 to 90 for admission, 15 to 90 for discharge. Uh, you would then identify the excluded stays. So that, again, that's incomplete stay, the uh, patient's discharge to hospice, et cetera. So then you would be left with the um, included stays. You would then calculate a change mo in mobility score for every 
patient in each ERF, um, for your ERF, sorry. Um, and so the range, because obviously somebody can have improvement, some people may have decline, so the potential range that might be seen is minus 75 or plus 75. Um, as I said, the national average uh, at a facility level is gaining 28.5 uh, mobility units. So the um, average change is uh, calculated for for an ERF, and uh, that's actually what's uh, reported on your review and correct for this particular um, quality measure, and it is also on, I think, the QM report. Um, again, you know, we, we report out one decimal place on the reports, and when, we, uh, uh, when the risk adjustment is applied, the regression coefficients all have those four decimal places so that it's as precise as possible. If you're interested in uh, more information about this quality measure, uh, again, you can go to the National, uh, National Quality Forum to learn more about this measure, 2634. Uh, all of the risk adjusters are there and um, all of the details. Um, as with the other measure, uh, this measure is currently under review by NQF, so there are updated specifications. So again, if you want to look at that, there's a lot of reliability validity analyses based on calendar year 2017 EarthPi data, if you'd like to look at that. Okay, so now we're moving to the last two measures, and these are different. Um, so the, the measures that I just described, 2633, 2634, those are change in self-care, change in mobility. That's something that I think most of you are very familiar with. Um, the data can also be analyzed in another way to get uh, a sense of how many patients within an ERF are improving at a level that's expected or beyond what's expected, more than expected. And so these last two measures use the same data that I described before, but the analysis is a little bit different and there is numerator and denominators with these measures. So I'm gonna walk through this first one with a little bit more time and then we can cover the uh, uh, discharge uh, mobility one a little bit more quickly. So um, again, the data come from the EarthPi, as we've said, with all of these measures. And this particular measure estimates the percentage of Earth patients who meet or exceed an expected discharge self-care score. So as I mentioned before, for each uh, uh, stay, each Earth stay, uh, the analyses that we've talked about is you can calculate an observed self-care score, which is basically adding the uh, scores together after recoding. And so let's say you could have a patient who has an expected, um, or I'm sorry, an observed change, or I'm sorry, an observed discharge score. So the discharge score for its self-care can range from seven to 42. So let's say you had a patient who um, their observed discharge score for self-care was 30. You would then look at the expected discharge score. So there is a risk adjustment model that I will be talking about very shortly, but it's very similar to what I talked about with the change measures. So you would look at the characteristics of the patients, the age of the patients, whether they had pressure ulcer, the person had pressure ulcers on admission, incontinent, et cetera, which comorbidities they had. And there's an expected discharge score that's calculated for each um, patient stay. And for this measure, you basically look at what was the observed discharge score and the expected discharge score. So for example, if you have uh, an observed score of 30 and the expected score was 34, the person didn't meet the 34 level. And so basically, they, this person would not get into the numerator. So they would count in the denominator, they would not count in the numerator. For this measure, more people included in the numerator is better. That, meant, that means that many of the patients in the ERF meet or exceed the expected scores based on their individual characteristics. If we had a patient who had an observed score of 30, and the expected score was 30, that person does get in the numerator. 
basically the criteria for this measure is in the second bullet, it's the percentage of IRF patients who meet or exceed an expected discharge self-care score. We have another example where, let's say, the um, observed score was 30, so I keep on trying that um, as an example, and let's say the expected score was 28. So in that case, the person exceeded the expected score. And so, because the person got 30 as their observed self-care score, once we did the recoded, their expected score was 28. So the person re uh, did achieve more than the expected, so they would count uh, in the numerator. So at the facility level, basically, you, uh, for this quality measure, you can go from basically zero to 100%, theoretically. So the target population for this quality measure is IRF patients who are at least 21 years of age, Medicare beneficiaries, and have complete stays. So uh, similar to the other measures, in this case, the same data elements are used. Um, we actually do create a separate risk adjustment model because we're modeling discharge uh, self-care as opposed to change in self-care. But the covariates, the risk adjusters, whatever you'd like to call them, we use all the same risk adjusters for the change in self-care and the discharge self-care model. And then the same covariates or risk adjusters are used for the change in mobility and the discharge um, mobility measure. So just again to reiterate th what this quality measure is, the discharge self-care score, basically um, the numerator, it's the number of patients in an IRF with a discharge self-care self score that is equal to or higher than the calculated expected discharge self-care score. The denominator is all uh, the total number of Medicare Part A and Medicare Advantage patients stay. IRFPI records with a discharge date during the measure target period, which uh, do not meet the exclusion criteria. So we have the same uh, exclusion criteria here. So again, or well, mostly the same exclusion criteria. Uh, we do have uh, patients with incomplete stays, patients with those medical conditions that I mentioned before, patients younger than 21, patients discharged to hospice, patients not covered by Medicare. One difference you'll notice is that uh, patients who started out independent in all the self-care activities were excluded in the change measure because that you know, isn't mathematically not possible to gain function. Uh, but in this measure, those individuals are included, those stays are included. So if somebody actually loses function, in this case, uh, that would be picked up in this measure. So you'll see, actually, there may be, possibly, uh, if you admit patients who are independent in all self-care activities, you might see a difference in the, the uh, target population size for the two self-care measures. But for the most part, I don't think you'll see a difference, or you shouldn't expect to see a difference. So the self-care activities that are included in this measure, again, we're just looking at the discharge codes, discharge scores, and it's the uh, seven activities. And there's just a note there that they're the same seven activities as the change measure. Risk adjusters, as I said, same um, risk adjusters as we talked about for the change in self-care. So as I said, it's about 70 or so, 75, something like that. And you'll see that this particular measure is in that table, and this is actually the third kind of, um, I guess, after the descriptors, it's the third column, discharge self-care, and you see the checks there, um, same age groups, also has an intercept. So I'll talk through how the observed discharge self-care score is calculated, and I'll touch on a little bit of the, how the expected is calculated just to reinforce that. But basically, um, you would calculate the observed discharge scores. You would identify the excluded stays. You would calculate the expected discharge self-care score. So again, you're applying um, regression weights or regression coefficient weights based on the patient characteristics, the, either the presence of comorbidities, the person's primary diagnosis, the age group. You would calculate the difference between the observed and expected discharge self-care scores. And so as I explained before, if the uh, 
patient's observed score meet or exceeds the expected score, the person is in the numerator. If the person's observed score is less than expected, they didn't gain as much as a patient who had similar characteristics gained in the national uh, data, that person would not be in the numerator, but would be included in the denominator. Then you would uh, basically calculate a percentage for the ERF overall, and again, we round to one decimal place. If you're interested in learning more about this quality measure, this measure is um, measure number 2635 for the National Quality Forum. As with the other measures, uh, this is currently undergoing endorsement maintenance. And so you will see at the top of the NQF page, it talks about updated specs. If you'd like to look at that, you can see updated specifications that are under review and also a lot of reliability and validity um, analyses at the item level, at the scale level, as well as the quality measure level. And the last quality measure is the ERF functional outcome measure, discharge mobility score for medical rehabilitation patients. So as you probably predicted, a lot of what I just talked about will apply here. So for the discharge mobility measure, um, again, collected with ERFPI, this estimates the percentage of ERF patients who meet or exceed an expected discharge mobility score. So as I mentioned before, um, there are 15 mobility activities, and so the range of um, scores for admission, um, or I'm sorry, for discharge is 15 to 90. So you might have an example where the observed score for an individual patient is, let's say, 75, and the expected score was let's say 80. So in that case, the person did not achieve as much as a similar patient in the national database. So that individual stay, individual stay would not be in the numerator, but would count in the denominator. If the observed score, let's say was 80 and the expected score was 75. So this patient exceeds the expected score that that person would be in the numerator and of course the denominator. If you have a, an ex, a patient who uh, the stay, the observed discharge score was 80, the expected score was 80, that's uh, it's meet or exceed, so that person would be in the numerator, so they do uh, would count in the the um, the numerator. And just I guess just as an example, let's say you had um, 200 patients or patient stays over a 12-month period. The, uh, the time period actually for all of the quality measures is um, a year of data. And it actually, uh, once it goes on Earth Compare, will be rolling quarters. So you could start out with calendar 2018 data. And then as the next quarter rolls on, you would add a new quarter for the first quarter of 2019 data, and you would drop off that first quarter from 2018. So it's a rolling quarter, um, but always 12 months. So let's say there was 200 uh, patients discharged, and let's say 100 uh, patients met or exceeded the benchmark. That would be 50% for this quality measure. So again, second bullet says estimates the percentage of ERF patients who meet or exceed an expected discharge mobility score. So again, 100 out of 200, easy math for me, 50%. Um, target population is the same of what we've talked about before. ERF patients who are at least 21 years of age, Medicare beneficiaries who have complete stays. The data that is uh, collected, of course, the uh, GG mobility data is the first box, and then the risk adjusters that we've previously talked about. Again, just to kind of walk through one last time, the numerator and denominator for this quality measure. So the numerator is the number of patients in an ERF with a discharge mobility score that is equal to or higher than the calculated expected discharge mobility score. And the denominator is the total number of Medicare Part A and Medicare Advantage or Medicare Part C patients uh, for, with submitted ERFPI records uh, with a discharge date within whatever 12-month period is being considered. I will uh, note, by the way, that for these quality measures, actually, let's see, uh, 
for the, all of the functional outcome measure uh, when there is less than 20 Earth Pi stays during a 12 month period. Um, that data would not be publicly reported because it may not, there's just no, maybe not enough cases to reliably um, come up with scores, quality measure scores. So I think many of you are aware for all of the existing quality measures, there's often suppression due to a low sample. Um, and so again, in this case, um, for all of the outcome measures, less than 20 cases uh, during a 12 month period, that would you would get that in your reports that Deb's going to be talking about shortly, but um, you would not get that, uh, it would not be publicly reported just because, again, the low sample. So uh, the exclusion criteria, we've kind of talked about these before. So again, this is the same as a change in mobility with the exception that somebody who theoretically could be independent in all mobility activities who theoretically got admitted to an ERF, um, but was independent in everything that's on in section GG uh, mobility, um, uh, they would be included in this measure. So the mobility activities, I'm not going to go through these, but these are all familiar uh, activities to you. The risk adjusters, again, the same ones that were used for the um, change in mobility measure. So you'll see history of falls here, as well as uh, prior functioning uh, stair negotiation. The uh, table at the end of the Earth QM measure calculation or Porter user's manual. This is the last column. So you'll see, obviously, we have an intercept in the same age group. So it's all consistent across all the four measures. The observed uh, discharge mobility calculation. I think you probably get the drift on how this is done, so I won't uh, go through this in detail. Um, but it's basically the re same recoding that's done that you've heard about before, calculated. Um, uh, at the patient level and then averaged at the, or I'm sorry, uh, calculated at the patient level with an observed and expected score. And then uh, there's a count of the number of patients who meet or exceed the expected score based on the national data. If you're interested in more information about this measure, this is measure 2636. And again, it is under uh, review uh, by the National Quality Forum. And so we have a lot of reliability validity data. If you're interested, just uh, click on that little kind of orangey gray bar that's got the updated specifications if you're interested in that. So I've mentioned the, so those are the measures. So thank you for bearing with me. Um, I did want to highlight a little bit more about the manual. I referenced that quite a bit in my presentation. So that is available on the um, Earth QRP uh, website. You will, um, if you go actually to the section about measures, you will see at the bottom of the page under downloads, so I think you probably all know, scroll to the bottom of the page, and I know Karen's going to talk a little bit about resources, so this is just, again, a resource related to quality measure calculation. So you'll see the actual manual, Earth Measure Calculations Reporter Users Manual. Version 3.0 is the current manual that's up there, so that's why that's on this slide. And if you're actually interested in the regression model coefficients, um, those are in an Excel spreadsheet, so you can actually, uh, you know, just grab those. Um, maybe no, not that interested in those. They're actually very interesting, um, and it really does tell you a lot about you know, the patients and how much function they're expected to gain. So, um, you know, as you start looking at this, I really would encourage you to try and um, look at that. Um, this is what the uh, cover of the manual looks like. Um, and so in chapter one, um, there's just, of course, terminology because there actually is a lot of terminology that sometimes, you know, quality measurement is such an interdisciplinary area of work. So please do look at terminology to make sure you're understanding when certain terms are used, what they mean. This manual does cover all of the different quality measures. So I have just highlighted the function measures, which of course are in here. Um, and so actually chapter six is kind of the main area, but you will see other things in there about the claims-based measures and the CDC measures. Um, Appendix A is where you find the model parameters. So that's kind of that table that I showed you with all the check marks. 
And in summary, because I have 52 seconds left, um, the ERF uh, functional outcome measures include one process measure that looks at a limited number of activities and looks at a uh, collection of data with section GG at admission and discharge as well as goals. For the outcome measures, we have four outcome measures, change in self-care, change in mobility, discharge self-care, discharge mobility. I hope that uh, this has been helpful for you to understand a little bit more about key components of quality measures, which was kind of early on. I hope that's been kind of reinforced about all the steps that's going on. If you're interested in more information, please do look at the website, and I'm also around for a little bit if there's questions. And I really do appreciate your attention. I know this can sometimes be tough stuff, so thank you so much for paying attention. <laughs>